Hello everyone, welcome to this 28th International Congress on Waterborne Transportation, Shield Building and Offshore Construction organized by Sabina. For those who do not know Sabina, the, Sabina is the Brazilian Society of Naval Engineering. It's a technical society that promotes naval engineering and ocean engineering in Brazil by disseminating knowledge for more than 58 years now. Uh, in a word, it's a forum to discuss technology and innovation. And I would like to remind you that Sobina is not only composed by naval and ocean engineer, but also by any professional or company working in the sector with a desire to actively participate in the technical committees and activities of the society. So you, you can make the difference. And if you have interest, please join us. Uh, at Sobina, we have uh, uh, several technical committees trying to map the current engineering challenges. For example, we have a committee on autonomous vessels. We have a committee on the offshore structures, integrity and maintenance. Another committee on platform life extension. Uh, a committee on decommissioning, for instance, also. But the reason today of our panel is another one, and it's linked to the Sobina committee called Marine Environment. Uh, and today we will have a, a really great session uh, dealing with uh, an actual topic, the decarbonization of the maritime sector. This is, uh, to be honest, the second section, session uh, today about this topic. Uh, only we have a session uh, uh, where we uh, welcome uh, uh, a representative of, of, of the IMO to speak about the topics and some scientists. Uh, but uh, uh, to, now we, we are going to uh, uh, present some uh, innovations coming from companies. And this, this panel has been organized in strong collaboration with the Department of International Trade of United Kingdom. And I have the great honor uh, to welcome the Deputy Consul General and Deputy Director for Trade and Investment for the United Kingdom in Brazil, Mr. Tony Preston, to give the opening speech of this session. Thank you, Jean. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event. As Jean said, my name is Tony Preston. I'm the British Deputy Consul General in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil and the Deputy Director for Trade and Investment in Brazil. And it's a pleasure to be participating in today's event. First, I would like to thank Sobina for the long-standing partner working with Sabina to promote partnerships between companies, universities and research centres in the UK and Brazil. Today's event is, we hope, an excellent example of our engagement in the Brazilian market and our commitment to the clean growth agenda. The maritime sector is an important part of the UK economy to which it contributes over 22 billion pounds per annum and more than half a million jobs, many of them in highly skilled roles. The industry spans subsectors that include shipbuilding and repairs, marine technologies, marine renewable energy servicing, leisure and small commercial vessels, science and research and consultancy. Uh, the UK leads the world in offshore renewable power development. This is supported by a world leading research and development and academic capability, including marine research and development centers, excellent technical knowledge and skills, and a very strong international reputation for quality. The UK government has committed to net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And to support the ambition of this ambition, uh, recommendations for the marine sector have been set out in the Maritime 2050 strategy. This involves the transformation of the shipping industry, as well as ports and bunkering infrastructure. The UK has been seen as a global exemplar in green maritime issues and will be a leading supplier of zero and low emission shipping te technology and green maritime finance going forward. Our strategy is to continue to play a leading role in setting international standards in this field and investing in increasing technological and economic transition 
associated with climate change mitigation. A range of technologies have the potential to play a part in the global transition to net zero emission shipping. Some of these will be presented today. So the objective really for today is to promote the debate around transition to, some, to a more efficient and clean maritime sector, as well as to intensify the relations and partnerships between the UK and Brazilian companies and institutions. I'm very glad that we are gathering today an excellent group of UK participants in several areas that can showcase UK capability and technological development in decarbonisation. The UK government's maritime team in Brazil, based here in Rio de Janeiro, is available to discuss more about the UK clean growth strategy, as well as discuss more about the technologies in this area. So please do get in touch. I hope to enjoy the seminar. Thank you very much. And back to you, Jean. Thank you so much, Tony, for, for this intro nice introduction. So today we, we will have uh, five speakers, five British companies presenting uh, their technology. And uh, the dynamic of, of the session uh, will be a, a presentation, a short presentation by each speaker. And then we will have a, a space for a, a couple of questions at the end of, of the session. So I would like to uh, invite uh, Charles uh, uh, Askel from Lois Register to join me here on the floor. And he's a business development manager uh, uh, in the section marine and offshore from Lois Register. And he's going to give a speech about decarbonization in shipping technology investment and community. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jean. Uh as introduced, my name is Charles Haskell. I'm the Maritime Decarbonisation Program Manager uh, within Lloyd Register. Um, I'm here to talk about general uh, the investment readiness uh, within the industry. So, really, as an introduction, where we are today. If we go into the um, IMO goals, moving towards 2050, and we're looking for an at least a 50% reduction of the total annual greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And obviously we need key stages in our ambition to get to 2050. Now this has come through uh, from work done by ourselves, um, along with UMass in terms of calculating the shipping emissions and where we need to get to and how we need to get to to achieve the ambitions for 2050. At the moment, shipping emits around 2.89% of the global CO2 emissions, um, but we also have to acknowledge it carries around 85% of the world's cargo. So whilst it's a high number, it's also carrying a very high percentage of world's cargo. However, if left unchecked, it will go up um, as global trade increases. Um, efficiency and renewables are not enough to reach this goal, and that is key. In order to reach 2050, we need to have zero emission vessels starting to hit the water by 2030, and then they need to be rolling out relatively quickly thereafter. Um, so why have we got this goal? Well, it's about the 1.5 degree limit set out by COP21 um, and the Paris Agreement as well, and we've got the UN uh, Global Compact Goals. It's listed here. And I think it's also important to remember this is not a maritime problem in its own right. The rest of the uh, global industries, such as agriculture, transport, heating, are all trying to reduce their carbon footprint. So maritime are not alone in this, and that has advantages and disadvantages as well. So where we are at the moment for maritime, if we look at what we're currently using, we're burning fuel oil and diesel and LNG. About 1% of the world's fleet is currently um, LNG bunkered. Um, and we're going to be moving to an era of methanol, hydrogen, ammonia, and biofuels, and potentially battery and uh, nuclear, and any unknown new techs which may come along. Um, However, it's not just a downstream problem. When we're talking about particularly ammonia and hydrogen, we need to make sure they come from a renewable energy source. So the upstream sector, which is predominantly dominated by coal, oil, and natural gas today, will have to also shift to um, either nuclear, um, natural gas with a carbon capture, biomass, and renewables. 
So it's not just about marine, it's about upscaling, and it's not just about pushing the problem from marine upstream as well. We need to start looking at a well-to-wake issue um, for, for, for getting down to zero carbon. To put this into perspective then, if we're going to be getting our fuels um, at the moment, if you think the maritime industry takes predominantly its fuels from the hydrocarbon industry and, and the um, really the residue left by the refining industry, is it needs to start, start taking it from renewables. And if we're looking at the world fleet, some of these maps and, and charts show if we're using photovoltaic or, or wind, the, the sort of land area required to uh, decarbonize about 50% of shipping. So there's various um, charts out there, but this really hopefully visualizes how much is needed um, but what we'll also see from this is for the renewables, we will see a shift from the energy resource from being those which currently supply hydrocarbons. It also presents opportunities in less developed countries to start to generate electricity and be able to sell off electrolyzed hydrogen and, and synthesized ammonia. So what's Lloyd's Register's role? Well, we're looking at future model scenarios. Um, getting the right regulatory drivers put into place and uh, the thought leadership and collaboration the papers we've written so far have led a lot of the debate and then obviously as a core business to Lloyd's Register is to ensure the safe and reliable um, adoption of these new technologies. Um, and where else are we playing our part? We've got the IMO providing regulation um, and, and other regulatory bodies such as the EU. Um, but we're also members of the Global Maritime Forum, um, the Getting to Zero Coalition, Sustainable Shipping Initiative, uh, and we're one of the founding members for the Poseidon Principles, which is really there from the banks to start offering incentives to companies to reduce the carbon footprint of their vessels. Uh, and that's from a, um, really for the banks as well to meet their environmental sustainability goals. Um, and from the papers so far, we've done joint projects with Maersk, MISC, Samsung, MAN, um, CMB, and Anglo-Belgium. And this has been producing hydrogen engines to projects in shipyards to validate the uh, fuels of the future. I'm just going to go through one of the case studies we've done and some of the modeling we've done. So this is for a um, 84,000 deadweight um, bolt carrier. So a standard bulk carrier, and it's looked at the technology readiness in order to adopt the various fuels. Now, if we're, if we're taking biofuels or e-fuels uh, for LNG or oil, obviously we've got quite a high, well, we've got a very high technology readiness level because these are already being adopted. It's just a different type of fuel. Um, but then when we look at hydrogen and ammonia, the technical readiness levels are lower down. Um, and this is just because they haven't been adopted to date. Um, and if we if we look at ammonia, so MAN at the moment uh, will have an ammonia engine on the water by 2024. So the technology readiness level will increase for that. So it's not really such a technology, a technological challenge in order to um, get the zero emission vessels on the water. This is again the same case study when we looked at the 84k bolt carrier. Um, we also looked at fuel prices, so we modelled fuel prices with UMass um, and how these will change moving forward, but the impact this will have on total cost of operation. So if we, if we took this bulk carry and we modelled the various fuels, we looked at the price of the extra investment for the engine storage um, for the vessel, and these are added into this chart. We've obviously the storage impact because some of the fuels are much less dense, so therefore will require larger storage and which will potentially impact your cargo. Um, and then we looked at the voyage costs, um, so your fuel costs. So the future fuels are going to cost much more, and I'll move on to that uh, on the next slide. But what this is also indicating is this is now no longer a CapEx problem. It is an OPEX problem. The future fuels are going to be two to three times more expensive than today's fuels. Um, and this leads back to what I said on one of the first slides is we're not going to meet the 2050 objectives by ship of, by uh, making vessels more efficient. However, efficiency is absolute key to make it viable. 
If we cannot make mess vessels more efficient, the cost of operations are going to be extortionate. We need to close the gap down so in order that the new fuels remain competitive. And this will be done through um, efficiency gains, both in the vessel itself and the technology for the vessel, utilizing wing, uh, harnessing the wind power, um, making vessels more efficient, both in the drivetrain uh, and the hull design as well, but also from uh, the likes of just-in-time arrival and operational efficiency. The next part is the resilience. There isn't going to be one fuel which is going to be for all applications. We're going to have a variety of fuels out there, um, ammonia, hydrogen, um, and the e-fuels, uh, potentially nuclear. Um, and each fuel has its own niche. But what we have modeled, and we had different pricing mechanisms for renewable oil price and how, oh, sorry, renewable energy price, electricity price, and how that will come down. And what we have found is that biofuels, whilst remaining relatively competitive today, they will increase in price uh, because of demands from other industries. Because as I said, this is not just a maritime problem. So other industries will be adopting biodiesel and biomethanol because these are going to be more readily available and easier to drop in for themselves. So the price will rise and they're also limited capacity. And what we'll see is renewable electricity prices drop, then the um, e-fuels will drop in price as well. So e-ammonia and e-hydrogen uh, will drop in price and there will be a crossover point around uh, 2030, 2040, depending on the different scenarios which we've modeled. So this is really showing we need resilience on fuels. If we're designing a vessel today, we shouldn't just be looking what will be the cheapest fuel in 2022 or 2025. We need to be looking ahead at the lifespan of the vessel and which vessel will be, uh, uh, which fuel choice is going to be best for the lifespan of the vessel. So really, um, on a conclusion for this it is moving forward is we've got the technology. The technology is not the problem here. Um, we That can be overcome. I'm not going to say the technology is here now, but it's, it's, it's achievable. The investment, we need to close the gap between the current fuels and the future fuels. Otherwise, there won't be any um, commercial incentive to move forward to a zero carbon um, trade and the community we need strong policy intervention we need the rmo to be stronger and to um and to put some clear policies so that the correct invest investment decisions can be made and on top of that for the community we also need to be looking at which countries are adopting uh which technologies the new technologies bring their own hazards so they need to get their regulations um in line with the new fuels. If we take hydrogen, the US Coast Guard don't allow hydrogen to be carried in bulk as a trade. So that's one uh, obstacle to be carried over. Another one is if we looked at nuclear, and for example, New Zealand will not allow nuclear powered vessels into their water. Although the nuclear power of today is very different from yesterday with molten salt reactors and many of the issues are no longer there. So the approach we're taking from Lloyd's Register is we're not just looking at one part, we're looking at a marine product readiness net model, um, and that's looking at technology readiness, investment readiness, and community readiness. And that, that's our getting to zero model. Okay, thank you, John. And that's that's sort of my opening part for myself. Yeah. I don't know if uh, I, I'm not in so thank you so much, Charles. Uh, thank you. I have some uh, some questions for you for you, but we, we are going to leave uh, them for, for the end. And I, I am going to pass to the next speaker and I would like to invite Andrea Trevisan from the company Ricardo UK. He is the strategy and business development lead for, for marine, rail and energy sectors. And he is going to give us a speech about fuel cell and battery solution for decarbonization of maritime applications. The floor is yours, Andre.
Andrea, I, I guess that you are mute. Okay, I'm sorry. Let's restart. Nice. So, um, I'm um, leading the strategy and business development within uh, Ricardo UK uh, for uh, the marine sector with a particular focus on propulsion. So what I would like to uh, talk to you today is uh, how fuel cell and batteries can be adopted um, uh, already today, now, for the decarbonization of the uh, maritime transport. Um, I would like to give you a brief introduction about Ricardo. So um, we are an engineering company present uh, uh, worldwide, nearly 3,000 uh, employees. The headquarter is in the, in the UK, where we have three technical centers, and we have technical centers also in Europe, uh, US, and in China. So we operate in a wide range of sectors. Uh, within our uh, automotive and industrial division, we cover uh, propulsion for passenger car, commercial vehicle, or highway, including marine uh, propulsion. Other division operates in rail, um, uh, defense, energy, and environment consulting. Within what we uh, call the automotive and industrial uh, division, we uh, deliver uh, technical uh, engineering consulting projects uh, focus on clean propulsion and energy generation cover uh, a range of sector uh, passenger car commercial vehicle of highway motorcycle and marine and power generation uh, rail defense and, and aerospace propulsion uh, within those sectors so we deliver turnkey projects engineering projects that go from from design uh, testing calibration system integration up to support to, to production. So what do we do uh, within the marine uh, sector? Is um, uh, propulsion systems, we focus on clean propulsion and we operate in the three pillars of decarbonization, uh, air quality and uh, um, extend asset life. So the, the main activities are around engineering of clean uh, internal combustion engine, whether it is uh, diesel and natural gas, uh, it can be a clean sheet or a conversion and upgrade of an existing engine, for example, the, uh, conversion to uh, natural gas, and the engineering of zero carbon solution. So alternative fuels and alternative propulsion, hydrogen, internal combustion engine and hydrogen fuel cells, uh, ammonia, ammonia internal combustion engine and ammonia fuel cell and battery system. This uh, page here is uh, uh, really to give you a very high level uh, view on the, our, our uh, view, our opinion uh, regarding the trends and the technology roadmaps in the, uh, in the marine sector. Um, so it's high level in trying to capture a wide range of application from uh, large uh, cargo vessels uh, to um, a cruise ship, uh, ferry, um, offshore vessel supply uh, down to, uh, to, smaller, to smaller application. So uh, there isn't one solution uh, uh, fit all. Uh, there is a variety, including uh, diesel, uh, natural gas, which will still be around for, for a while, and um, um, alternative low carbon fuel, uh, so green hydrogen and green uh, ammonia. So all clearly driven by the, um, the target that we all have, I will target 50% reduction greenhouse gases by uh, 2050, with compared to the uh, 2008 level. I would like to uh, talk a bit more about uh, um, batteries and fuel cell and uh, how those two technologies can be applied uh, today in the maritime uh, transport. So we have here uh, two examples, um, a large cruise ship, 2,500 uh, passenger, which will use typically more than 30 megawatt of uh, propulsion power and a few megawatts of hotel power 
for uh, uh, port operations. The cruising time can be very uh, variable from a few hours up to 20 hours. Um, and the second example is a, um, a much smaller um, ferry for, uh, let's say, 200 people, 200 passengers and uh, up to 30 cars, which will require around 2 megawatt of um, peak power for propulsion. And the cruising time can be uh, can be um, can be a few hours, maybe maybe a couple of hours. Battery and fuel cell. So let's have a, a closer look to to those two um, to those two technology uh, readily available uh, on the market. Before we go to see how those can be applied uh, in those two specific cases. Um, the battery I've reported here is a large pack, um, a large pack, uh, five megawatts of continuous power. It can deliver um, uh, 10 megawatts of peak power and store 10 megawatt hour of energy. So when the recharging is done um, um, through the main propulsion engines, uh, when the, the ship is, is cruising, the recharging can take Quite a lot of hours, uh, up to 20 hours, for example. It required 20 um, cubic meter of space, and it weighed 85 tons. The electrical efficiency is quite uh, is quite low, 40 to 45 percent, when it is recharged uh, using the main diesel um, uh, engine uh, during the cruising time. Um, as for the battery, multiple. Uh, fuel cell can be put together to to give a much larger uh, pack. In that case, five megawatt hour of uh, uh, five megawatt of continuous power, and the energy storage depend really on the on the fuel supply, the form on the on the tank size. Uh, there is no need to recharge on cruising, and for no diversion of power from the main engines, and uh, it requires much more. Um, 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 space than the battery in that case it can be 180 120 uh, cubic meter for this for this size of, of fuel cell and the weight uh, remained quite significant 60 to 70 tons uh, the efficiency is much higher the electrical efficiency can be higher than 60 percent um, advantage it can produce hot water if we are using a solid oxide fuel cell the uh, service life also of, can be quite quite high. We, we are talking now of uh, uh, around sixty thousand hours. Um, so, how those can be used in the example, the battery, the fuel cell can be used in the example that we have seen before. The large uh, the large ferry um, uh, achieves zero emissions in a port. Um, for its uh, um, hotel uh, loads. Uh, it needs, uh, in that case, one megawatt of average power um, during the four hours of, um, of port call and up to two megawatts of peak power. So a solution is using uh, um, a large battery pack, 5.5 megawatt hour in that case, uh, that are recharged during the, the sailing time. Another solution is a, a smaller battery, much smaller, 0.5 megawatt hour, and a fuel cell of one megawatt uh, of continuous power. Um, the chart here on the right uh, provide the investment cost for those systems. So the blue lines uh, define the cost of the fully battery system, and the red line is the cost of the combined uh, system where the fuel cell deliver, deliver the average power and the small battery uh, deliver the peak through the port uh, calling time. Um, at the case that I've described of four hours uh, port call, the uh, fuel cell plus the battery provide 12% benefit in terms of capex and up to 1% percent uh, of uh, um, fuel cost uh, saving compared to the battery only solution that would recharge the battery while while cruising so a, a 
the fully battery solution is cost effective only uh, for short uh, port call and uh, um, um, and the uh, otherwise the the combination of the two systems um, is is uh, of advantage in terms of capex and slightly there is a small advantage also in terms of, of fuel cost the second example um, is the um, small ferry which operates at uh, zero emission while cruising and need one megawatt of uh, uh, average power and two megawatts of peak uh, that's for propulsion um, so if it used the battery only system the battery must be recharged from uh, the short power which require high infrastructure costs in, in the chart on, on the right, the bold blue line represents the capex cost um, at various uh, uh, time between recharging, and the dotted blue line represents the cost of the battery uh, plus the shore power cost. So the alternative uh, red line is the fuel cell system with a small battery, which do not require shore power uh, because it is recharged by the fuel cell directly but clearly it requires uh, uh, fuel delivery at port hydrogen uh, for example for a uh, short lag the battery only solution is the right one in that case uh, for more than three and a half uh, hour the fuel cell um, um, plus a small battery is clearly uh, is clearly better Another way of looking to the average cost um, and the, uh, the advantage uh, in, term of, in terms of cost is uh, looking at the, um, at the uh, peak to average um, and, and the load profile of the, of the application. So in this chart, we have the same one megawatt uh, average power needed through a uh, four hours of continuous operation. And the fuel cell uh, with a small battery is best for moderate peak to average power, up to three in that case. Uh, after that threshold, after three, the uh, best option becomes the battery only because you need a large battery to cope with a very spiky power demand. So from the, the two example of the large ferry using uh, a zero carbon system to provide hotel power and a smaller ferry using zero carbon system for propulsion, uh, we have seen that the, the, the fuel cell benefit in terms of capex increase with uh, longer duration in uh, a zero emission mode uh, where the battery only system starts to get very um, large and very costly. Battery only vessel are um, um, cost effective on short sailing and have a large investment uncertainty that need to be considered around the required short power um, infrastructure. Peak to average ratio has a significant impact and uh, a combination is still better for quite uh, uh, peaky uh, duty cycles. Clearly, it is key when we, uh, we assess the benefit of the two uh, solution, it's very key to, uh, to identify the right size of, uh, um, of the system, uh, the relative size, size between fuel cell and, and, uh, um, and batteries. Um, and this is not always easy, uh, especially when the supplier are trying to sell their own technology. So a battery supplier will, will push for a very large uh, battery, the fuel cell supplier will, 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 will probably uh, try to oversize the, um, the fuel cell system. So to define the optimal um, uh, configuration, when we use a software uh, that we develop, which is called um, architecture independent modeling, which is supplier agnostic, it considers the vessel's uh, routes, the power profile, the efficiency of the batteries, the efficiency of the components of the um, electric powertrain, so motor inverter, uh, and the cost of the components. It combines all the elements together and it provides, um, um, it scans through all the candidates, and finally it provides the optimum uh, according the specific target of cost uh, 
profile, mission profile, and uh, uh, performance targets. So in conclusion, let me recap what we have seen. Um, so the maritime transport is undergoing an unprecedented pressure for the decarbonization and the uh, emission reduction. So IMO, IMO set the targets of uh, um, a 40% reduction in CO2 intensity by 2030 compared to 2008 and 50% um, uh, reduction of total greenhouse gases by 2050. Uh, we are also seeing um, a very strong push for uh, uh, alternative propulsion and alternative fuels from uh, uh, local governments and uh, authorities, as we see um, uh, several funded projects in, in those areas. And a range of options are under development from a clean diesel and uh, natural gas combustion system to um, to uh, zero carbon, hydrogen, ammonia, internal combustion engine, and fuel cell and battery systems. So among the zero carbon options, um, battery and fuel cell are readily available, uh, both for short uh, range vessel, in that case for directly for propulsion, or for large vessel, in that case for uh, uh, power generation. Um, and the careful engineering and sizing of the battery versus the fuel cell is, is, is really key for the uh, effective um, um, uh, investments and operating cost. And we've seen as uh, uh, model-based developments and, and tools are really key uh, to achieve those, uh, uh, those savings. Thank you, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's all for me. Uh, Jean, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, for this nice uh, technical presentation of this case study. Uh, I will pass uh, the floor to invite to the floor the next uh, speaker, which is Simon Schofield. is the CTO from Bar Technologies, and he is going to give us a speech about design innovation lead decarbonization. Good evening and uh, and thank you. Good morning there. Good morning. Let me see if I can share my screen. Hello all and uh, as was mentioned my name is uh, Simon Schofield and I'm the CTO of uh, BAR Technologies here in Portsmouth in the in the UK and uh, BAR Technologies is a, a sim simulation-driven maritime innovation firm. Uh, we were formed in 2016 out the back of the uh, British entry for the uh, America's Cup. Um, we, uh, we have a, a wide-ranging uh, team of specialists who have a, a common thread uh, in their work that we look to uh, to drive uh, innovation forwards and use simulation and uh, digitization to increase the efficiency of all the all the products we're involved in. We have a, a wide range of uh, projects, and this is just a, a little uh, flavor of them, and then I'll go into some, some more specific projects in more detail. Uh, but on the top right, you can you can see our heritage and where we came from, which was the the America's Cup. Uh, which, for those of you that don't know, is uh, is seen as Formula One of the of the yacht racing arena, if you like, where we have some very uh, technically advanced uh, flying vessels. And as I mentioned, we take uh, not the IP and the um, the designs directly, but the the design know how, the design tools and the knowledge, and apply those uh, for a wide range of uh, projects. Top left is uh, is a is a foil assisted power boat that we'll talk about in a little bit more detail in a minute, and taught in the center is is the CT bit we'll also look at. Bottom left and, and bottom center is a, another project which we won't talk about today, but is uh, is very interesting. It's a it's a hybrid uh, 
um, diver delivery unit, which has a has a the ability to undertake 40 knots on the surface for uh, 250 miles, and then transitions into a wet craft and dives 30 meters down uh, and can do eight 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 knots for uh, 25 miles under the surface. If you, we take uh, uh, some examples of some projects which uh, we're involved in, and uh, how we've brought technology to bear to to um, bring advances in efficiency. And from those advances in efficiency, obviously you bring advances in uh, emission reductions and, and fuel reductions and decarbonisation. The first product range I want to talk about is is FOSS, which is a, a foil optimization stability system, and it started life. Uh, in in the leisure boat market, and this is one of the examples of the of the vessels we've designed, which are fitted with foils. Uh, and this one was done very early uh, in the life of the company, and uh, is a, a product which is sold by Princess Yachts in the UK. And what FOSS does is it uh, reduces drag first and foremost, but it also increases the comfort and the uh, the accessibility of performance. So this vessel is, is fitted with uh, two hydroplanes under the surface, which obviously we have a lot of knowledge and, and background in from, from the foiling race boats. And these foils are uh, entirely automated in their, in their control and they're, they're active. And they do two things. They uh, support a certain amount of the displacement of the vessel, so making it more fuel efficient. And they also... Uh, they, they combine to uh, control the roll and pitch of the vessel that gives not only better sea keeping and better comfort, but can also allow the, uh, the users in these smaller, more dynamic boats to, to control the, the feeling of the boat, whether that's in a comfort mode or a more sporty, dynamic mode like you would experience in your car. Uh, on this vessel, we... Uh, we had a drag reduction and an associated fuel reduction of circa 30% um, compared to a traditional vessel of this, this size and type without having an impact on, on the VMAX. So um, at, at 30 knots, we were 30% less fuel efficient with the same installed horsepower. We could still do, we could still do a top speed of 50 knots. We've taken this technology and we've developed it uh, for wider applications now and um, we are certainly looking to fit it in, in various commercial applications, uh, including the use, uh, use on, um, on uh, oil rig, uh, high speed um, supply vessels where there's definitely uh, significant fuel savings to be made. Another area where we're using the technology uh, extensively is in the, in the crew transfer vessel market. Uh, as, as I'm sure you know, um, the offshore wind uh, turbine industry in Europe has has grown rapidly and very quickly over the last uh, few years, and um, the vessels uh, are required to deliver operators daily uh, to these wind turbines, and it's almost a little bit of a dirty secret. They've got this beautiful green energy, but um, catamarans traditionally delivering crew out to those turbines for either OEM or, or construction, which are producing thousands of tons of CO2 a year. We took a step back and we thought we want to do something about this and we wanted to develop a product which was, uh, which was better, both in terms of comfort for the crew and in terms of uh, CO2 emission and, and fuel consumption. And uh, leaning on our, our optimization techniques and all the tools and techniques we use in the America's Cup, um, we've developed this product here. It's uh, slightly different looking when you first see it, but it has uh, some very distinct benefits. And what you have is you have a longer, long, slender uh, primary hull with a, a swath style, so, so a small water plane area style outrigger. Uh, and they combine with uh, also two sets of foils, one which is mounted under the transom of the of the main hull and a second which is mounted uh, on the outrigger. Those foils are, are fully active, just like in the smaller boats we saw earlier on. And um, they, they combine to one, again, take a certain amount of displacement of the vessel and provide very powerful and efficient trim control but also reduce the motions by controlling roll and pitch. 
Um, these vessels are in, in construction. So there's two in construction for uh, delivery in Europe early 2022. Uh, and they'll be going straight into working in the wind farms in the North Sea. Um, the first two that are being produced have a, a fairly standard drivetrain, but we have developed a, a fully hybrid option, which is uh, can be used electrically about 80% of the time once offshore charging becomes available. Uh, and the next boats which go into construction, we are expecting to incorporate that technology. But just looking, uh, taking a step back from uh, from the drivetrains and the um, and the power supplies in all 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 conditions. If you can increase the efficiency of the design, it uh, it it reduces your reliance on fuel. And as uh, one of the speakers said earlier on, that when fuel prices are are, are expected to become more expensive, as we're using more exam more um, more advanced fuels. Uh, efficiency of the design and reducing what any whatever sort of energy you need to use is key. So on this on this design um, on the CTV, when we benchmark it against a traditional catamaran, which is currently used in the industry, we are seeing savings in in fuel of anywhere between 50 percent at fifteen knots and uh, kind of twenty two percent at thirty knots, and in the normal operational conditions, somewhere around thirty knots. And if you look at um, the reduction of emissions, which uh, that equates to, that's anything up to a thousand tons of CO2 a year per vessel. And there's many, many tens of vessels operating daily. Um, but probably just as importantly uh, for these designs is the um, is the well-being of the, the the technicians they take to the to turbines. If we can reduce the accelerations and we can make the the vessel operate in higher sea states we can get technicians to turbines and keep those turbines producing power more often with less aborted trips and this vessel uh, delivers a reduction in vertical accelerations of anywhere between 30 and 70 percent depending on the uh, angle of attack of the waves and the sea state making this a two true uh, two and a half meter HS uh, vessel, whereas the, the vessels that are currently used in terms of catamarans are generally 1.7, 1.8 metres significant wave height. I think that's well demonstrated in, a, in one of our simulations here, which is undertaken using um, RAN CFD. You've got two identical um, uh, sea states with the vessels running at identical speeds, uh, traditional catamaran on the left, and our vessel running with active foils in the simulations on the right. And I think you can clearly see the marked difference in uh, motions. As I mentioned, uh, first two vessels are in construction um, and will be going to the uh, European wind farms. We've also got considerable interest from both the US and Asia, which are both uh, expanding markets um in 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 ctvs and also interest from the oil and gas industry and specifically for that industry we're developing a larger 50 meter vessel which is uh capable of doing 45 knots and has a three meter significant wave height uh, capability and the the views that we used as a helicopter replacement for delivering uh, personnel to to oil rigs or wind turbines which are, are much further offshore so moving on to uh, another one of our products um, which we uh, which was touched on in one of the earlier earlier uh, presentations and the the need for reducing uh, emissions in the in the larger shipping fleet in larger ships and the use of wind technology to to help aid that both in terms of reducing the amount of fuel required um, and making it economically viable again this is an area where um, BAR technology has a lot of heritage and uh, where we spent uh, spent our our time as a race team and you can see the vessel on the right and the bottom left images were images of wings which were developed uh, to propel race boats, uh, obviously very efficiently. And we took that technology and we wanted to, to look at how we take that knowledge and those simulation tools 
and all the work we've done squeezing every percentage of performance out of a, out of race boats and how we'd apply it to ships to to try and make a difference in in terms of uh, fuel save but rather than jumping straight into uh, designing wings for ships we took a step back and we we took our, our performance prediction tools that we were using in the America's Cup and redesigned them, reconfigured, reconfigured them specifically for ships. But because before we can design uh, the ultimate device uh, for reducing, uh, for capturing the wind for ships, we need to be able to accurately simulate uh, the performance of the vessel and how whatever device we are, are designing interacts with that ship and the ship's propulsion methods and all the uh, negative and pos positive effects fitting a hardware to a ship has and then combine that with um, weather routing so we can holistically um, determine the performance of the ship and the fuel savings for a given route based on statistical weather data uh, rather than kind of looking at the problem through rose tinted glasses. Um, and moving on we, 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 we developed uh, using the tool an, an idea of of the performance profile of the wing that we would want to develop and we move forwards and we've developed a um, a three element um, wing which is going to be fitted to large uh, bulk carriers and um, and oil tankers or product tankers and uh, today um, so you're kind of the first presentation to hear this we announced a, a significant uh, partnership with Cargill and a commitment to fit these wings to uh, a number of MR2 tankers with a fleet of dry bulk carriers coming shortly be behind. Uh, and we hope to be launching the first vessels by the end of 2022. Um, taking a, uh, a case study of the technology we like, we're looking to fit and using that ship seat tool to, um, to determine the, the real fuel savings, um, looking at it based on uh, real trading routes, uh, real ballast and low conditions, and on uh, optimising for the most economical uh, use. So rather than just driving the speed down, we're looking at combining uh, the optimization using both the cost of fuel and the cost of charter to give a, a realistic operational profile. Taking all into all that into account, we see fuel savings um, in this route on a, on a retrofit of 28%. Um, and that is pretty typical for what we see on uh, retrofitting. But then when we look to fit these on a new build, which was the, what we will be doing with Cargill, we're seeing fuel savings of anywhere up to 40% and typically somewhere in the mid 30s. So these are significant fuel savings, which are going to not only um, help save CO2 and emissions directly, but are going to make the use of um, future fuels and tick, which are potentially going to be more expensive, more economically viable as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Simon, for this uh, really insightful uh, uh, presentation. I will leave the question for the end, uh, and I will invite uh, Said uh, Jardani for uh, his uh, speech. He is co coming from our, our Tyne Bridge Propellers Company, and he is a design and development engineer. Said, uh, you are going to speak about improving vessel propulsion efficiency through physical testing and numerical simulation, probably CFD. The floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Sean, for the uh, introduction. Uh, my name is Said Javjani, and I'm uh, the design and development engineer um, uh, at Timbridge Propellers. We uh, I'll, um share with you what we do at the moment and what we basically make uh, at the beginning. Uh, we are basically a, a manufacturer in the UK. Uh, in the past 45 years, we have designed and manufactured um, propellers, uh, shafts, and uh, all the shaft line assemblies, brackets, and rudders. And uh, now, uh, 
not only we're using the numerical and physical testing to improve our designs for our customer, we're also offering the um, consultancy service for numerical and physical testing services um, for propulsion efficiency and uh, underwater and, uh, noise and vibration from the propulsion systems. The physical testing uh, for us is done through uh, our test vessel, which we call it the uh, floating uh, laboratory. And uh, this is a catamaran test vessel. It's basically designed to be hacked uh, in its software and its hardware to test for different basically applications, including propellers, um, design and test of the rudders and um, other basically uh, marine products, uh, including the uh, basically tidal energy uh, products. So we can test um, propellers uh, up to 1.2 meter diameter on the, uh, on the test vessel, which is quite closer to the reality of uh, uh, most cases in the smaller end of the market. And it has less scale or Reynolds number effect when it comes to a bigger size vessels. Um, the propulsion system for the vessel is a potted propulsion system, so the propeller can be easily um, basically uh, swapped and test uh, on the same day if we have different design and we compare them. We want to compare them actually back to back, which is quite, quite I think, important in terms of um, getting the results uh, from uh, different designs if you're looking into the direct comparison of the efficiency of the systems. The boat has an uh, underwater camera system where you can basically look at the uh, propeller in operation and uh, you can look at basically uh, possibly the, the um, cavitation uh, pattern developed on the propeller. In this case, um, the propeller was rotating at uh, lower basically speed, so you won't be able to see any cavitation on the propeller. Uh, the purpose of why we're doing this is to basically um, validate and um, correlate the numerical simulations, which is the true CFD simulations and uh, basically some FEA finite element analysis and compare them with the real uh, live data we capturing on our test vessel on the um, different cases. On the um, left bottom side of the um, slide, you can see, for example, that's the wake field behind a ball carrier. Sorry, uh, I'm yes. sorry. I, I guess that you are not sharing your screen. May you check? I have. My apologies. I haven't. I thought I have. Can you see my screen now? No, no, yes. Thanks. My apologies. Then I have, I, I basically just had one slide, which was basically the um, test vessel before this. And I'll move on to the um, basically physical testing and the numerical simulations. Why we are doing this? Uh, uh, because we are trying to validate our um, basically numerical simulations and um, understand better the um, physical testing results we are getting in terms of, for example, if you're looking at the stress distribution over the um, surface of the blade, if we just change the design, how that would affect basically the um, stress distribution, or we're looking at the uh, cavitation pattern or the propeller efficiency. Uh, on the left bottom uh, of the um, screen, you can see the uh, wake field behind a ball carrier as a case study we were looking into. Um, uh, that disc shows you basically the uh, um, wake field as it's been seen by the propeller. And as a result of the low velocity area behind the hole um, on the top of the uh, shaft line, uh, the cavitation pattern is um, greater uh, on the blades when they pass through that point, as you can see on the um, basically uh, propeller um, next to the um, inflow disc. Then we're looking at the um, basically stress distribution of the um, propeller uh, based on different designs and we making sure that the uh, distri uh, stress distribution is acceptable uh, based on the um, uh, allowable stresses for the propeller uh, 
And also we are looking at basically the pressure distribution and we use that pressure distribution of this uh, basically propeller within the wake field at different uh, operating condition. And we use that for um, modeling the actual um, uh, pressure distribution uh, to consider the stresses over the blades. In the past uh, two and a half years, we've been involved in a, a research project. Uh, uh, the research project was basically um, uh, funded by the Energy Technology Institute, uh, which is a collaboration between the UK government and uh, other companies. And uh, the project uh, had a three million uh, budget available to us, which Towards the end of it, we only managed to spend one and a half million. The um, objective of the um, whole project was to reduce the fuel consumption and uh, therefore the um, CO2 from uh, uh, merchant vessels uh, in the UK waters, waters. We were looking at uh, bulk carriers, tankers, uh, cargo carriers and uh, um, other type of vessels in the UK waters. Um, through the uh, optimization techniques and uh, using CFD, using finite elements and the fluid um, structure interaction uh, modeling, we managed to uh, improve the efficiency of the hydrodynamic efficiency of the um, propeller by three and a half percent. That's purely optimizing the propeller for the uh, operating conditions. Um, we had some novel uh, uh, design. Uh, to add into the um, efficiency one, which was uh, the clamp on blade, which is the detachable blade uh, technology. We had the pitch adjustment technology. This is a um, basically passive um, method for uh, optimizing the uh, power absorption of the propeller. And the uh, in overall, uh, about 4% can be added into the uh, proportion efficiency by adopting, for example, the um, clamp on blade uh, system or the um, self adjusting uh, pitch technology. What we are using the, these days as an uh, approach to design the propeller, uh, it's an integrated design approach. Um, it's not any more, it's not any more acceptable or, or it's not efficient anymore to design a propeller in the uh, basic isolations. Uh, what we need to look at into is the emission profile of the vessel, um, look at the operating conditions and the uh, changing the operating conditions. Um, traditionally, what we do is we um, design a propeller for the open water and we optimize the design. But uh, with our test vessel, um, we can now um, basically validate our predictions in uh, CFD. And uh, also with the CFD, we can uh, look into the wake field of the vessel and then adapt the wake field into optimizing the uh, propeller design. We have also developed a 1D ship simulator, which considers basically the uh, mission profile of the uh, vessel to improve the efficiency based on the operating condition of the uh, vessel. And that's probably give us a um, better um, uh, understanding of the um, real world vessel uh, operation and uh, the optimization through this um, procedure or integrated uh, design approach um, could be quite um, significant. As an example, in here we have taken a um, um, small size ball carrier, you say um, basically handicap size ball carrier, um, and uh, we have optimized the uh, design. Uh, through a, a number of different, basically, um, uh, approaches. One was looking into the um, uh, design of the propeller and the blade sections. Uh, the other one is to a systematic design approach for um, for geometry optimizations. And finally, we've used an uh, algorithm-driven optimization technique. Uh, the graph in here shows about uh, 500 uh, plus different designs that we have, the, uh, that the uh, algorithm uh, has gone through to find the best uh, um, basically design. Uh, you can see that the uh, improvement in the efficiency in absolute terms, it's uh, almost about um, one, uh, 2%. And in terms of relative um, 
basically improvement is about 4%. That means when we're looking at the uh, improvement in the uh, power consumption, that's about 4% improvement in the basically um, efficiency. Uh, the uh, physical testing actually help us to understand um, more whether the um, uh, design algorithm or our uh, best design selected by the computer, is it in the real world uh, applicable or not? And that gives us quite a good uh, indication whether um, the software can uh, use basically the um, available data to us to design a propeller which is applicable to this uh, operation condition. And then we use the um, data we capture from the um, uh, test vessel, and uh, we basically put this data back into the software into improving the design. And further on, as I mentioned before, we've been moving into looking into the uh, propeller performance uh, within the uh, weight field of the vessel or behind the hull, and then we're using the mission profile to design. The, the test vessel itself, is, as I mentioned um, before, is a catamaran uh, vessel, and um, it, it can take six per, uh, personnel on board, uh, including the um, skipper. Um, the pot system, as you can see in the uh, left side, uh, can be uh, um, basically uh, lowered down to the uh, to the water through a uh, moon pool, which is almost about 1.5 meter by 1.5 meter um, in dimensions and the, the engine available for um, uh, basically the pot system has about 500 horsepower um, diesel engine. We are looking into uh, basically changing the uh, portion system into a hybrid system at the moment. And um, the vessel also has two outboards at uh, 40 horsepower, uh, which can, basically take the boat uh, into the um, testing uh, or sea trial ground. What we use at the moment in terms of onboard uh, data collection, we use um, uh, LabVIEW and we have a uh, onboard fortuity for uh, accessing the data uh, at the same time as we um, basically uh, capture the data. Um, we're using uh, quite a novel um, technique in measurements of the uh, loads on the propeller, which is torque and the thrust. It's quite a complicated, basically, um, area still in marine industry to measure, in particular, the thrust from the propeller. Uh, that is being measured on the shaft of the uh, part of propulsion system. And the, the test vessel has um, two teledyne, basically, um, Doppler velocity locks, uh, which gives us quite a good and accurate speed through the water. Uh, readings, that's very important in terms of considering um, the uh, hydrodynamic efficiency because we need to know the actual or accurate uh, speed through the water. Um, it also gives us um, uh, different uh, capabilities to uh, track the bottom and, and map basically this the seabed and then the high frequency um, capability of the um, Dopplers also uh, allows us to uh, provide the water uh, profiling. And the uh, canvas data is also captured. And um, the, uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we have a under, uh, underwater video uh, camera. Uh, it can look at the propeller and look at the cavitation performance at the same time. This is, um, this is a case study of the uh, ball carrier, as I, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier, the, um, on the left top, uh, corner of the slide, you can see the original design of the propeller, which was um, actually quite a, a efficient design at the time when it was uh, designed, I would um, imagine, because um, the standard um, design for the industry um, at the moment is considered to be um, if the propeller has efficiency of uh, Wageningen plus uh, 1%, that's a good designed, let's say, um, uh, propeller. Uh, on the um, uh, left bottom, you can see the optimized design through the um, uh, optimization algorithm or even um, basically software uh, development. And um, you can see on the right the graph the results of the um, CFD simulations versus the C trial data. 
Um, the dash line gives you basically the um, original design and the um, uh, solid line gives you the um, uh, optimized propeller, the efficiency. Uh, to, to be able to compare this and um, validate it against the um, well-known, for example, Wageningen and B-Series, you can see on the um, uh, top right corner, the CFD uh, results. We have uh, basically predicted for the Wageningen series and the uh, bulk carrier we were uh, looking at as a uh, test case and the final design. The uh, right uh, side bottom actually graph shows you the physical testing results. The very interesting observation for us was that the pattern predicted in CFD it matches very well with the physical testing. Also, the um, although the um, uh, absolute values uh, are more attractive in physical testing. Uh, in the numerical simulation, I believe due to the fact that um, a, a lot of basically parameters are under controlled in, in, the, um, in the simulations, the, the difference in the results is not um, as significant as in the physical testing. With the CFD results, um, we have predicted 4% um, improvement in the efficiency and the physical testing it was about 9.2% improvement in the efficiency results. And finally, um, the hydrodynamic efficiency of the uh, propeller, um, as we have tested for this uh, case, uh, gave us about 4% um, uh, improvement in the um, power uh, consumption and um, relatively the same as in the fuel um, consumption. That's it for me. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Syed, for this uh, nice presentation and this optimization uh, case. Um, I will invite the next speaker. Uh, next speaker is Stuart McKinney uh, from Shipping Solution. He's a team leader in this company and he's going to give us a presentation of uh, about retrofitting ships for decarbonization, challenges and opportunities. The floor is yours, uh, Stuart. I guess that you are on mute. Hi, Boataji to all Boataj. the people viewing. Thank you. Uh, th first of all, thank you uh, to the organizers of Sabina uh, for inviting me to talk at this event. Uh, I would have obviously preferred to have flown to Brazil and been part of the, the Congress, but unfortunately that's not possible at the current moment. Um, so yeah, basically I'm focusing on uh, retrofitting ships for decarbonization, which is obviously going to play a really important part within preparing the world fleet for the new decarbonisation and low carbon targets. Just to give you um, a little bit more information uh, about the com my company, um, we're a group of experts and design engineers and naval architects who help ship owners with maritime uh, environmental compliance. So for the last few years, we've been focusing on today's problems of Sulphur Cap 2020 and uh, ballast water retrofits and um, the, the kind of IHM inventory of hazardous material regulations. And we've, you know, obviously been helping a lot of ship owners and we've, we've gained a lot of, you know, information and, and you know, the kind of feeling uh, towards these new challenges that, you know, owners will face, um, you know, moving to this, this new future. And that's why as a company as well, like we've moved from today's problems to tomorrow's problems and challenges and you know we're positioning ourselves as you know kind of decarbonization uh, integration experts so that we can help the ship owners choose the right technologies optimize those technologies and you know successfully uh, implement them into their vessels now just a question i suppose before i go uh, into some more of the kind of content i have for people today is you know, touching on what Charles from Lloyd Register was saying uh, about, 
you know, all these industries have the same challenges as shipping, as in we all have to find a new low carbon or zero carbon fuel. And I suppose the question is, will, it, will shipping be given this choice? Like, will we be able to dictate, we want this kind of fuel, we want this kind of fuel segment? Because if we look at the current situation today with how the, the kind of fuel has been spread, you know, each industry has chosen their, you know, sub fuel within, you know, the, the carbon based fuels. And, you know, you have aviation with kerosene, you have automotive, agriculture, power generation, and then of course shipping who who chose the, the kind of heavy fuel oil, the stuff at the, the bottom. And obviously it's now low sulfur fuel oil, so uh, a little bit of improvement um, upon that. But I suppose the question is, you know, today every industry seems to be individually coming up with their own solutions. But who will actually decide on, okay, power generation gets priority for hydrogen or, you know, the automotive industry gets priority over batteries because ultimately some of these things are still, uh, they're, not, not, they're not an infinite resource. So, you know, for me, there's still questions surrounding will shipping be able to actually choose or will we be given something that no one else wants and we will have to make do uh, with that which i think is quite an interesting point the other question i would have as well is you know given this uncertainty and uh you know what, what the what is expected of shipping for the future is ordering a new build vessel today a good idea uh, from an investment point of view because you know, even though it does feel like this is truly a period of change, and obviously there is a lot of talk about this change, and there's a lot of cool new technologies, and um, there's a lot of uh, you know good good stuff coming from industry. Um, the question is, how will that change over the life cycle of a vessel? And as as an owner, as an investor, how can I make that decision today? Which is going to potentially change um, in, in the future. And my feeling is, you know, currently I feel there isn't enough answers yet to allow the, the owners to make these decisions and to make investors make these decisions. But essentially, maybe that's what sums up shipping. It's, you know, an industry of winners and losers uh, taking market gambles. So I think it will be uh, really interesting uh, for the future, um, you know, either way. So moving on to the retrofit challenge of decarbonisation, like obviously the, the average life of a ship is approximately uh, 25 years old. And, you know, even if all the ships were ordered today were zero emission ships, which, which you know, they're not, they're not yet, there would be a considerable amount of ships not zero carbon or even low carbon by the time, you know, we get to 2035. So certainly retrofitting will play a very key role in decarbonisation for sure. But also as well, the ships of today, like, uh, will they be built to allow for retrofitting into these new markets, or will new will new regulations make sh ships of today obsolete? There's all these kind of uh, big questions, but essentially, retrofitting will be a key market segment in in making uh, shipping uh, adhere to its um, you know commitments which we have uh, made. So to kind of break it down into the kind of three main areas, and you know, this is taken from the International Transport Forum's breakdown of zero carbon or carbon reduction, reduction technologies. And the, the, the three main areas can be defined as obviously technological uh, reduction, uh, operational, and then of course the, the bigger one, which is alternative fuels uh, and, and, and energy. And if we, if we look into, each one of those, like obviously the technological ones, um, is you know kind of what we've been seeing from some of the other speakers here. You know, you've got your, uh, you know, optimization of propellers. You know, you've got your your optimized hull designs. Um, you've got all these, uh, you know, great ways of reducing uh, energy efficiency. Sorry, increasing energy efficiency. And I think for a retrofitting point of view, these will be the easy wins. I think there is a lot of scope uh, within existing ships to do some really, you know, simple changes, which which could have a quite a big life cycle impact uh, throughout the vessel's uh, life. Uh, life, you know, 
easy wins, for example, making sure all lights are LEDs, variable speed pumps, and just having a more smart approach to energy use and obviously waste heat recovery. I think those are relatively low to medium cost uh, implementation that can be done with low to medium complexity. And it's all those kind of like smaller games which can, can add up to, you know, something more substantial. And I would say from other industries and from, you know, other sectors, there's already some really great uh, existing knowledge and, you know, mature knowledge and mature technology, uh, which can be readily uh, applied into shipping. And maybe that's something that needs to be encouraged more uh, with, with the existing fleet as, as we have it. So the next kind of element uh, would be the operational element, and this ranges thing, this ranges sorry from things like obviously the the kind of slow slow steaming um, kind of philosophy, which which I know a lot of people are pushing for just now, to other operational um, ideas such as you know when when the ship comes into port, there's a shipshore interface which they can connect from you know green powered. Uh, electricity so they can switch down the main engines but I think there's also like a kind of hidden operational gain to be uh, benefited from here and I think it's more from the whole kind of industry of ship management and running the asset as a business and and that is like you know from the superintendent having to fly it to the ship twice a year uh, that's from you know managing supply chains of you know sometimes parts just getting randomly flown around the world I think there's actually quite, you know, significant, uh, you know, decarbonisation benefits to be um, gained from by embracing technology such as having a digital twin, so that instead of flying out to the ship, the the superintendent can, you know, handle handle the business from the office, which, you know, can significantly reduce that carbon footprint of the operation, uh, you know, over time. But I suppose again, it's it's something that needs investment. It's something that needs probably more of a mindset change of adopting like this being there from anywhere, you know, having smart sensors, you know, even having the bandwidth on ships, which is, you know, like a kind of rarity to find a ship with a really good internet, you know, connection. And, um, you know, there, there's certain things that need to be unlocked to allow these kind of uh, operational changes, which will reduce the carbon, uh, you know, impact uh, from that as well. And, you know, again, those are kind of low to medium wins in terms of cost, in terms of complexity, uh, small gains adding up, and again, te technology that is just is, is quite mature uh, in terms of being able to to implement. The final one is is the kind of alternative fuels and energy, and obviously this is the big one that everyone's talking about, and you know. Probably no matter what way you look at it, like you know, having a, a transfer to one of these fuels um, could, can be quite a costly retrofit of high complexity. And it's currently, as as even we've seen some previous slides, you know, the maturity, the techno, the technology maturity, isn't yet quite there to be, you know, an off the shelf and kind of popular choice. So I do think there's a lot of of you know, as I said at the start, there's still a lot of information that owners need. Uh, there's still a lot of considerations that have to be done before it's kind of something that's going to be retrofitted onto a ship and you know we, we've seen some owners through say public funds or you know special funding uh, you know attempt say LNG retrofits or you know even some of the other ones and you know just now those retrofits are subsidized and they're not yet yielding you know a cost-effective uh, solution but I think there's also other questions we have to think about as well, like, you know, if we are, um, you know, being very specific with our fuel needs and putting it so niche that it can only operate, say, in Northern Europe, then what happens for the, the, the asset over time? You know, like if you pass that asset on to another kind of area of the world, which traditionally happens, you know, from a Northern European ferry to maybe Indonesia, are you locking that ferry into Northern European and therefore ruining its potential to be a useful asset for a longer time? These are questions that have to be answered as well, because I think what no one wants to see is ships being built, becoming 
not useful for one market, but not being able to be applied to another market and therefore going to be scrapped um, early, which is probably, you know, a, a net loss in terms of its uh, carbon effect, which, which you don't really uh, want to see. So kind of summarizing that up, you know, I think it's really obvious that, you know, for retrofitting, it will be a balance and it will be selecting different, you know, technologies and operational and fuels. It's going to be, you know, a toolbox that you have to take various elements from. You know, I, st I still think there needs to be a lot more performance modeling and validation, especially when there's interdependencies and impact between them. And, um, you know, just now a lot of manufacturers of technologies are being like, yeah, we've got the best thing. It's given you like 20% savings, but you know, there's there's a there's a gap in knowledge there between like this is a saving on a great day when everything's perfect to what how is this going to be helpful when I'm in the middle of the Atlantic and you know like the wind's going crazy and the waves are crazy. So, you know, ship owners are really skeptical. They are really traditionalists, and you know I think there needs to be a link in between those two kind of uh, stories so that we can we can pull the the owners and the industry in the right direction and. You know, that at Clean Ship, that's kind of like what we have been doing. We've been doing that for the, you know, Sulphur Cap 2020 in ballast water. But now we're kind of transitioning to that, being that middle man or that, you know, independent expert that can help owners, you know, select the right technologies, you know, do the right proof of concept and ultimately turn that from a product into, you know, a successful uh, lower zero carbon um, um, ship. So just you know a few final thoughts there summarizing that up you know decarbonization and retrofitting is one thing but you know i think there's so many gaps in required knowledge and as an industry you know that there's so many like changes that will have to happen to allow this decarbonization to happen and a another example or question is you know where will these decarbonization retrofits take place like our traditional uh, ship repair locations ready for it, you know, like Turkey and China. Do they have the skill sets and the facilities to enable new things to happen? I think it's, I think it's something that you know the whole, the whole community and the whole industry has to come together to to kind of work out. And you know that that actually that that extends to you know the crew and the training of naval architects as well. You know, like are, are we preparing our people today to be able to deal with these new totally changing technology and application for tomorrow. And it, you know, it's always, it, it's quite funny, you know, I, I was at a talk last year in Hong Kong and um, someone showed me, you know, a picture or the speaker showed a picture of a normal ship. And then he has all these new technologies coming off it. And for me, I, I, I think that's the wrong approach. Like I think the ship of tomorrow will not look like a normal ship or should it look like a normal ship because the traditional propulsion technologies of having a big engine room, maybe that isn't the way forward when you have power packs which can be powering localised um, needs around the vessel. So I think the, the future is exciting for decarbonisation. Uh, I think there are a lot of gaps of knowledge. I think there's a lot of technologies which have to come in closer to the realities of shipping. But hopefully, you know, the next 10 to 15 years, are going to be really exciting for naval architects and transitioning to this new way of thinking. So th thanks very much for your time once again. And um, yeah, happy to take any questions in the, the panel. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart, for this nice presentation. Uh, I will uh, invite all the speakers to join me here to pick up uh, a couple of questions from the audience and also I prepare some here because the topics was very interesting and technical and I would like to 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 ask for some a couple of, of, of questions from me. Mm. Um, well, I guess that it was very interesting because uh, in this panel we we observe uh, uh, two kind of solution, the short term solutions, optimization what we have uh, from Said, for instance, or uh, Simon uh, presented some some technologies uh, of of, optim of optimization and and um, uh, CFD uh, runs analysis and other uh, solutions that are 
uh, for uh, to be uh, uh, efficient, such as uh, a new technology, such as new fuels and so on. Uh, I would like to first uh, start with a, a comment here from the YouTube channel uh, from Paulo Oliveira. And he's uh, telling uh, uh, that is th there, there are many uh, fuel alternatives today. And he's asking if uh, uh, we think uh, that in the future the vessels uh, should be have or should be able to run more than one fuel type. Uh, and uh, uh, wondering if the flexibility will be uh, more important than now. So might be uh, Charles or might be Stuart uh, or even yeah. Andrea can answer this one. Um, I think it's a good question um, and, and it really ties down to technology on that side and therefore cost of implementing the technology. Um, fuel cell development will be very crucial for that part because you can be that some of the fuel cells can be fuel agnostic so they can flip between one fuel to the other. Um, but then we're going to come into the challenges of storage of the fuels um, and therefore you'd require different storage and it's the storage which is taking up cargo capacity. So whilst you could have flexibility of fuels from a technology point of view, it will come back down to that investment choice and, and potentially loss of cargo space. Thanks. Someone wants to complement this one? Yeah, I, I, I really agree. Um, I think um, um, it's actually really key to find a solution which uh, uh, minimizes the need to have more uh, fuels and ideally uh, really one uh, fuel. So probably um, um, at least as a transition, there could be uh, an interest to try and use fuel that can uh, be um, used in uh, uh, different propulsion systems system and type. For example, and if I think to fuel cell, fuel cell can operate, uh, yes, with hydrogen, and that will be completely zero carbon, but they also can operate with uh, natural gas, for example. Uh, clearly, you will have carbon, but at least could be a transition for a, a small period of time where maybe the industry can adapt uh, to the new technology. So, um, um, commonization, I think, is, is very key. And there are some combination that can help the, the transition and to, to accept the new technologies. Thanks. Um, uh, relating to fuels, um, uh, you mentioned uh, hydrogen, for instance, or but uh, the, the, there is the same problem for other fuels. Uh, uh, I believe that life cycle uh, assessment or life cycle analysis is really important. Uh, how to produce the hydrogen in a sustainable way, sustainable way uh, or the other uh, uh, innovative fuels for for uh, for mine, marine industry. So when you ask, uh, you show uh, Andrea uh, a, a case study uh, for the Ropax uh, or this ferry, uh, do, do you consider this uh, this kind of uh, life cycle analysis for for the production of uh, hydrogen itself or or not? Uh, yes, so the cost that we use for um, uh, hydrogen was uh, was accounting um, um, already green hydrogen, uh, which is available in limited uh, amounts at the moment, um, and it is, is much is very expensive clearly, um, and is predicted in a way to go down very quickly in the next decades. So if today we may be around twelve uh, dollars mm -hmm. per kilo, it's predicted. Really to do more than, than, than half in the next uh, uh, 15 years. Um, uh, but for, for the long term, really, the, the solution is green hydrogen and green ammonia, uh, that's for sure. So produced from, uh, from, uh, from solar. That's, that's the goal, that's the target. Okay, nice. I agree with you. Um... I, I wanted to, to speak once uh, a little bit more about uh, a fuel uh, uh, and this problem to, to I am forecasting that uh, in the, during the transition period it, it is difficult today to see a, a, a winner for, for the next generation of fuels. 
um, uh, and, and this is a, a problem to find a balance between flexibility and, uh, uh, and efficiency. Uh, also, th there is another problem that that we are facing, on is, which is the uh, availability of, of the fuel itself. We was discussing uh, during the morning session that uh, uh, Brazil uh, has a lot of experience with biofuels, for instance, and uh, probably there there is no problem of availability of this kind of fuel in the future in Brazil. However, in other countries, it will be not the same. So. Uh, what is your feeling about this uh, winner technology uh, for for the, the transition and also at uh, at the long term? Do you really do, do you see a, a winner uh, for the next years and for the next the next decade? Um. So I'll, I'll go forward. There is um, we don't we don't see a winner. It's going to be a multiple fuel choice when we've analysed different vessels, storage capacities. It's not a case of one fuel is um, suitable for each vessel type and size. So we're going to see a fuel mix um, across vessel types and also trade and 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 size of vessels. So I, I think we will be. Um, there is not going to be any clear runner, which presents opportunities and threats as well. Um, in terms of fuel availability, and, and as I said, it, it's, we're, in many ways we're competing with the whole industry, in many ways we're, uh, with other industries, uh, but we'll also be complementing the other industries. And we need to look at what other people are doing. If we look at ammonia, ammonia is being used extensively by the, uh, uh, by the agricultural industry at the moment, um, and the current supply meets the demand. Now, we can't take that as a drop in fuel because, as you discussed earlier, same with, green hydro uh, same with hydrogen when we're talking grey hydrogen, green hydrogen, the actual well-to-wake fuel source to the wake of the vessel will give a higher CO2 output than we're currently delivering. So we're not really delivering what we were set out to do. So the question will be is how can we how can we share infrastructure cost because to decarbonize the shipping industry with these fuels we're going to require over a trillion dollars of infrastructure investment um, on, on the land side. So this is less so of a, of a ship ship problem itself from an investment side. It is a problem on the land based side. Thanks, thanks a lot. I will pick up a, a question here from the YouTube, uh, and this uh, about is the same about uh, alternative fuels. Uh, the question is uh, uh, might be for for Stuart. Uh, uh, how how keen uh, the the industry uh, uh, is today uh, to pay uh, studies. It might be a, uh, I, I guess that I lost my connection temporarily. Uh, I, I will uh, repeat the question. So the question is the following, uh, uh, and might be for Stuart. Um, so uh, there, there are many alternative fuel solution available and also a solution of retrofitting of, of ships as you presented. And, and the question from YouTube uh, from Nara is, uh, how keen the, the industry are today to, to pay for uh, engineering service and, and studies to try to, to go ahead with the, the decarbonization of, of maritime industry? Yeah, I, th I, think, it, I think it's really dependent on um, like what, what niche industry, um, you know, you, you, you are seeing a lot more for the smaller ferries like in Norway and in and, and the UK, you know, you are seeing, you know, a lot of efforts in examining hydrogen, uh, battery power adoption. Um, I, I think these are being, you know, subsidised through research grants and, you know, special uh, investments. So I, I think where, where that's available, you, you are seeing people look at things, but, you know, for the for the wider industry, the deep sea, deep sea shipping, it, it's kind of quite a tough time for them in general. So, um, you know, it, it's going to be interesting to see what players, you know, push forward with plans for for more research into it and the ones who just sit back and wait and see. 
Thank you, Stuart. Uh, I, I got one for here uh, for, for Simon from BAR Technology. Uh, I was curious uh, about uh, the, the first case that you present, uh, on with, which is uh, related to the foil uh, below the hull of this, uh, uh, this small boat. Uh, is that foil is uh, dynamic with a flap or uh, any uh, a moving uh, component or it is a fixed foil? Yeah, it's, it's fully dynamic um, and controlled by automated control system. Uh, on different vessels, we, we create that variation in lift in, in different ways. Some have flaps, as you say, and in other cases, we, we move the angle of attack of the entire, uh, the entire foil. Generally, the latter is used on the more uh, commercial vessels because it's a little bit, a little bit more robust. So it is, it, it is responding directly to the motion of the of the of the hull. Nice. Yes, so. we have a number of algorithms that we've developed, and you know we develop the control system as well. Um, the, uh, that yeah, correct. Cr controls the lift dynamically to uh, either optimize efficiency or, or sea keeping, and there's a balance between which you can obviously you can select. Uh, uh, Simon, you, you present a, a picture uh, uh, about a bulk carrier uh, with uh, three or four cells. I cannot remember the number of cells on the top of the main deck. But there, Correct, there was yes. a logo of, uh, of Cargill Company. And Cargill Company, as you probably know, is really uh, active in Brazil, uh, specifically in soybean uh, exportation. Uh, this, I don't know if you can answer to this, <laughs> to this question, but uh, uh, do uh, can you give us uh, uh, or there there are plans to to Cargill to implement that that technology uh, for a line a commercial line uh, from Brazil? Um, so so Cargill were announced today actually as our as our partner as our launch partner and they're our technology sponsor if you like. Uh, for the implementation of of wind wings on on ships, uh, the plan is to start with a number of MR2 tankers, with uh, quickly followed by a number of uh, dry bulk carriers. Um, where they're going to be used on their on their global routes, I don't know. Obviously, cargo owner or own and operate a huge number of ships, um, so whether they're used out of Brazil or not, I don't know. But uh, certainly, Brazil has been used as a, a port in some of our modelling. Uh, and our simulation for for looking at savings on Pacific routes based on you know, historic weather data. Great, great, thanks. Uh, and uh, last one from YouTube here, uh, from Carlos Neves. Uh, do, do you provide, Simon, only external design solutions or you are also involved in internal solution as of electrical system and power uh, systems? Uh, it depends. So it, certainly uh, on the smaller vessels, we tend to provide um, full turnkey design solutions. We do an awful lot of the design of the, the control systems and we kind of develop from embedded code level upwards, uh, certainly for the, the more dynamic smaller crafts. And the, the submarine, for example, is um, it's full fly-by-wire. It's hybrid. It's got um, a large number of sub batteries for subsea operation. Uh, we've undertaken the entire... Uh, design and build of that vessel, in fact. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Said, uh, I got uh, one question for you. You present uh, optimization uh, results of uh, a propeller. And uh, as you know, uh, when we deal with optimization, mathematical optimization, my first question is uh, which type of algorithm you, you use for that study? And my second question, the most important one is, uh, how robust the analysis is uh, when we got the design uh, from the algorithm uh, did you uh, verify the robustness of, of the of the solution of the design of the designs proposed by the algorithm i mean uh, did you made a sensitivity analysis uh, if some uh, small variation of some parameters of the proper are giving a uh, high variation of the efficiency of the propeller or, or is not a problem in that case? 
Uh, no, that's actually a very good question. Yes, we need to interfere with the algorithm. At the moment, um, most of the optimization algorithm, they start looking at uh, basically a designer space, but how to pick a basically location and the designer space, because for a design and a propeller, you can have more than maybe even uh, 20 different uh, variables in the design. So we need to interfere with the uh, basically optimization algorithm and we do robustness analysis to make sure what we achieve it's in terms of basically performance, um, in terms of uh, material strengths and, and many other uh, aspects, uh, vibration basically aspects, it's, it's all valid. And, and main thing uh, for physical testing and the numerical optimization, I was trying to actually deliver the message was, uh, the optimized design is always being tested um, physically on our test vessel and we feed back the data we capture from the physical testing into our optimization, uh, basically routine to improve the optimization routine and how uh, the algorithm is basically searching for the best design in the uh, design space. Yeah, I think I can, I can second that. Thanks. Um, we, we obviously use very similar methods um, coupling CFD with you know neural networks and AI techniques to develop surrogate models and you know the ability to rapidly explore a design space uh, accurately means you can you, know, you can investigate design parameters uh, more fully and make sure you're not developing very peaky designs effectively that deliver in in real life much closer to the uh, the, the design solutions. Uh, just one more thing I um, I think I should add to what Simon was saying. Sometimes we still do, do need to steer basically the um, uh, design optimization algorithm towards basically a more um, uh, feasible designs. Sometimes this is still required. Continuing with, uh, with this optimization, uh, uh, you mentioned that material strengths could be a, a constraints for the optimization. Uh, do, do, uh, do you uh, think that additive manufacturing could uh, solve uh, the, or, or relax this kind of uh, material strengths constraint? And, and did you uh, uh, recently worked in your company with additive manufacturing uh, for uh, propellers? Well, we, we have looked at it in a, in a few cases, but as I mentioned, if we want to add all the parameters uh, into the design optimization, uh, we, we probably end up with um, weeks and weeks of simulations without really being able to um, get, get an optimum design that it actually works. So we need to limit um, some of the criteria and um, some of the physical testings basically is done we take that results and add it into our uh, design algorithm and use those physical testing on the material or, or um, basically other, other tests that we do and add that into the um, design algorithm as the basically um, limitations or constraints of the design uh, optimization uh, study. Thank you, Sid. Uh, there is one question more for you, probably uh, from Paul Oliveira in the YouTube channel. He is asking if uh, you are applying energy saving devices or trying to simulate also this kind of technology in your uh, in your models. Um, yes, uh, obviously we have to because um, I believe some of these energy saving devices they provide quite a good, um, uh, basically improvement in the. Um, fuel efficiency. So we have considered um, uh, a few of them. Uh, depends on the vessel type. Um, there is, there's no one solution that fits all. Uh, well, whether it's a, it's a good thing or it's a bad thing, um, um, that's for the industry to decide. There is no single solution to all the problems. As we were discussing earlier, one fuel could basically be the answer to all type of you know, vessels and operations. 
uh, I personally doubt that same happens with the energy saving devices. For example, if you're looking at the high speed vessel, um, I say high speed, for example, um, we're talking about 25, 30 knots, or you're looking at um, a low speed vessel. So it's completely different in terms of energy saving devices that could be retrofitted or it could be integrated in the design and the um, uh, basically early design stages uh, by the naval architects. So yes, we are looking at that. And I'm afraid uh, because the um, uh, basically they are um, commercially a bit um, sensitive at the moment, I can't uh, discuss the details of it, but um, I'll check this and the part that can be shared, I'll, I'll definitely share with uh, uh, Sabina and then um, if you want to share that data or information with your audience, uh, we're more than happy. Thank you. Uh, a steward, uh, uh, I understood that uh, a cost uh, benefit analysis is critical uh, for, for your, uh, uh, your business. Uh, and you mentioned during your presentation that uh, there are a lot of uncertainties about uh, uh, technical parameters uh, for, for the various solutions that you should uh, analyze during retrofitting. How are you considering uh, uh, the uncertainties about the technical parameters for cost-benefit analysis? Yeah, I suppose. I suppose. I mean, as as a like the kind of advisor to to helping assess the technologies, I think you 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 kind of have to look at the kind of worst case scenarios and you know try and uh, you know try and model it out from 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 there because obviously the the manufacturers of the technologies are coming from the the best case scenario. So um, yeah, I think as, as I said, there's a lot of data. And, and information missing, and a, it's a case of trying to, to to patch together the information you have from the operational side of the vessel, what it's doing just now, how it has to adjust, and then checking that against the the kind of new technology and then the, the kind of combination of them. So it's 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 not it's not an exact science at the moment, but you know we we have to work on new tools and models and verification strategies to to, to help that decision making process. Thank you, thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, I, I I will leave you a, a space now to to maybe uh, give a, a final words because we I I guess that uh, we treat all the questions uh, at least the online questions. So uh, please feel free to to give a final consideration if you want. Right, I'll, I'll start. I started the presentation, so I'll, I'll start. Um, so from my side, um, we, we can see the energy efficiency gains moving forward. Um, the big question is, is um, the incentive is needed to encourage more companies to adopt the energy efficiency measures which are available today and to be able to make them commercially viable um, and that's always been a problem in shipping between the charter owner um, arrangements which is why it was great to see the announcement today from Cargill along with BAR as well in terms of pushing that forward um, but what we really need uh, to move forward into zero carbon we need to reduce that price gap between the fuels so we need clear policy uh, and regulations going forward to reduce that price gap to then be able to make it more um, commercially sustainable to uh, and, and therefore be able to make the correct investment decisions moving forward. Thank you. I agree, fully agree with you. Do I go next? And on my side, uh, um, on, on this, uh, actually on this, um, on, on this side, it's, so the decarbonization is a big theme, and uh, it, clearly, if we think to a uh, large uh, vessel and cargo vessel, um, um, uh, the big question is: Can you really have fuel cell hydrogen for uh, 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 um, several days of cruise? So I think uh, technologies are available, and uh, 
um, uh, I think the importance is to go through uh, small steps. So clearly we are not uh, 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 thinking to put fuel cell on a large vessel, but targeting small uh, achievable uh, target, I think is really key like for uh, um, uh, supporting some part of the of the um, of the energy generation on board is possible targeting small vessel is possible that will really um, um, uh, um, um, have the, the the new technology to penetrate the uh, maritime sector and that's very key and that's very key also to get used to the technology to take down through time the cost of the development and the cost of the fuels. Um, and I think uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, funded projects, clearly, uh, especially for from Europe, but also uh, we are seeing uh, vessel operator, uh, owner and manufacturer trying to uh, do by themselves without accessing to uh, public money, essentially. Uh, with those small steps, as I was saying. Thank you, Andrea. Um, I don't. I don't think there's going to be a golden bullet when it comes to solving the decarbonisation problem. Uh, it's going to be a combination of of many innovations. Uh, you know, there there's been lots of talk today about fuel cells and future fuels, and they're all going to pay a, a huge part of that, of course, but they're going to be expensive. And we need to also focus on the, the root cause of the need for energy and try and make the vessels as efficient as possible and reduce the engine requirements. And then obviously look at, at alternative fuel supply, uh, power supplies, such as uh, wind propulsion. Um, I think a lot can be achieved through uh, embracing mm -hmm. modern simulation techniques and optimization techniques, um, the, the use of CFD and, and digital twins and AI and neural networks and all the, the great stuff is here now. It's been used in the cup for probably the last five years. Um, you know, it's not unusual to build hulls now that haven't been, been, been touched by a human hand. They've been developed through automated design processes mm -hmm. uh, and we need to embrace that in the in the wider marine industry uh, to to reduce the need for fuel to start with by reducing the energy requirements of, of vessels thank you simon um as a, as a supplier of the uh, marine industry we, we get quite excited about the opportunities ahead of us i think the industry is moving uh, in the right direction. Uh, we see a lot of potential with the hybrid propulsion system and uh, electric propulsion systems and uh, many other basically uh, energy saving devices that comes into um, basically industry and uh, different basically uh, propulsion aiding uh, units. Um, uh, from uh, our point of view, we, we are really um, seeing the potential in um, doing something which could be meaningful in terms of improving the efficiency. But I think the key is for different, um, basically, parties involved, uh, from the uh, hull designers, from the operators, from the shipbuilders and, and uh, um, regulatory bodies, all of them to really communicate to each other. And um, doing one part of the, basically, job in isolation, I don't believe will give us the um, ultimate solution that we are looking into. Um, we got the tools, we got the technology. Um, I think it's the impl implementation of the uh, knowledge and technology is the challenge. I, I doubt that personally that the technology is the main challenge. And I can see the potential through a lot of recent actually activities and things that we have seen all of us and um, a few basically projects that we've been involved in with electric propulsion or the hybrid propulsion. And I think we just need to start talking to each other um, more often. Thank you, Said. Yeah, I, I would just like to echo, I think like, you know, the echo of the thoughts of the other panelists and I suppose just finish it off on and say it's, it's an exciting time to be a naval architect for sure. <laughs> thank you, Stuart. So thank you guys. It was a really productive uh, 
uh, panel and, and I believe that uh, we'll have uh, uh, some opportunities uh, created here in Brazil for you guys. Uh, I also uh, uh, foreseen that uh, we have uh, plenty of solutions and, and today the, the challenge is to uh, uh, probably as you as you mentioned in your last words uh, first optimize what we have using uh, advanced technologies neural networks simulations and so on but we have also also in in parallel to to think about the futures and and uh, new fuels and, and new and thinking out, about, uh, out of the box and for, for for new technologies so thank you so much for your participation here and for your time i hope that we will be in contact uh, for next opportunities thank you thank you very much thank you John. thank you all cheers thank you. good evening bye. Bye. thank you bye